Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to um, the GLP working group on behavioral models for, of land systems. Um, this is our, our latest webinar um, in July 2024. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, so this working group we're interested in um, thinking about how we represent, how we model um, land systems and agency people, institutions within these land systems, um, how they create change, how they influence um, uh, functioning uh, of, of the land system. So primarily through things like agent-based modeling, but it's we're not just restricted to agent-based models, um, all sorts of different types of modeling that we, we can think about. In its previous incarnation, this, this group focused on um, large models, but um, now we are, you know, we're, we're open to all different scales of um, of models and analysis. So thanks for joining today. Um, we're going to have two interesting uh, presentations uh, with opportunity for question and answers and discussion. Um, so we've got an hour session. We'll split this into roughly two 30-minute uh, sections. Um, and hopefully on the screen here, you can see um, our two two presentations, our two uh, that we're gonna that we're going to have. Unfortunately, uh, Christian's camera is not working, um, so we'll be able to hear Christian and see, see his slides, but we uh, unfortunately won't be able to um, see him. Um, and Christian and Rob will go first, um, and then we'll, later we'll have Tim Williams uh, as well. So really grateful for you guys to take the time um, uh, to talk about. Um, some of these interesting things. Um, I'll pass over, without further ado, I'll pass over to Christian. I'll let Christian, I'll let you introduce yourself. Um, I think that's always the best way to do things. Yeah. So I'll thanks. stop sharing my screen. Okay. I'm going to share mine. Can you see it? Can yes, you hear me? We yes, we can see your slides and, and hear you well. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, James. Uh, thank you for inviting us, uh, Robert and me. Um, and um, yeah, my name is Christian Trost. I'm working at the Department of Land Use Economics at the University of Hohenheim in Germany. And Robert uh, is working at the Agricultural Economics and Policy Group in Zurich in Switzerland. Um, I will talk about a paper that the two of us and uh, several others uh, wrote together. I will present today, but Robert is here to uh, join the discussion and uh, give some insights uh, also on how he uses uh, what I'm going to talk about. And um, what I'm going to talk about is basically the content of this uh, paper that you may have come across already that's called How to Keep It Adequate, a Protocol for Ensuring Validity in Agent-Based Models. It came out last year and was published in Environmental Modeling and Software. And um, it actually was born out of a session at the 2020 IMS uh, conference. Um, I had some ideas, and then I was uh, joined by the other authors that you can see here. And they all are kind of involved with agent-based modeling from very different disciplines. So. Um, we hoped to join a different perspectives uh, on this basic ideas. And the basic motivation was that when you do agent-based modeling, um, either doing it yourself and trying to sell it to other people, or I mean, sell in, in, in the sense of publishing it, or uh, even more so as a reviewer, when you review other agent-based models, you often come across like very short sentences in, in the paper on how people validated or tried to validate the model, you, you read things like, we have a goodness of fit of 0.9, so that's good, we, we're going further. Or you read things like, yeah, it's anyway, we're modeling all about the future, we cannot verify the future, so we do not claim to predict the future. And yeah, there's a lot of different things. And always as a reviewer, you would have to say, yeah, but that's not enough, you have to say this and that and, 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 and that. And to each of these, you could add, uh, reply and see, I need more information. Have you thought about this and so on? But the main thing is, at least me personally, I ended up writing a whole page to say what I needed. <laughs> every time I did a review and every time I wrote 
a, a paper to explain what I was trying to do or why I thought this was uh, validation, because we felt there was a lack of a common reference to which you refer to. And this was espe this especially exacerbated by the fact that um, agent-based models have such a large range of applications that what works in one case doesn't necessarily work in another case. And so you can't say agent-based models are validated like this. So the idea was to come up with the foundational paper or something like that, that, that explains, okay, how do you choose the right method for your, for, your, for your case? And we ended up starting with this very basic of uh, statements that you read in nearly every um, article on validation and simulation modeling. And that is model validity is the adequacy of a model for its purpose. And that says everything, but it also says nothing because for every uh, stage or every application that you're doing, you have to again think about, okay, what is my purpose? What is adequate for that purpose? And well, in setting out, taking this as a start, we said, well, what is validation then? Validation, if, if we take this seriously, is building a structured argument why the model is adequate for the purpose of the analysis. Um, or if you think about it a bit more, more precisely, then it's actually building a structured argument why the conclusions that you draw from the simulation analysis have been validly drawn and not only valid, but also a sound conclusion. And when you think about, when we started thinking about, uh, well, what kind of arguments are these? Then we found like basically three types of arguments that you would use. There's some non-standard arguments, which we also discussed in the paper, but I'm going to focus on these to keep it short here. So the first ones are behavior-based arguments, then there are structure-based arguments, and there are robustness arguments. And I'm going to run in the next slides quickly explaining what they are, and especially also think about what are the preconditions for these types of arguments. So when can you use them and when not? So what are behavior-based arguments? Well, behavior-based arguments is anything that's based on comparing the model behavior to an observed system behavior. Anything that reads like the model fits observed behavior or anything that's associated with things like estimation, calibration, empirical validation, data-driven model selection, goodness of fit, predictive accuracy, cross-validation, cross validation, all these things. And for any of these to really work, um, you need to um, control for sampling error because any observation you have is conceptually just a sample of what could have happened. Um, and the second thing is you need to make sure that the data that you have is representative for what you want to simulate. That means um, there are no structure breaks or no regime shifts or no non-stationarity uh, between the observed and the target situation. If you have that, if, so if you have full representativity, then you can directly generalize and you can say, okay, the way the model performs in the, um, in the sample, after controlling for sampling error, I can only also expect it to perform in my target situation. But if that's not the case, you cannot do that. What you still can do, though, is some kind of what we termed indirect generalization. That means if you have some structural arguments, which we come next for a model, and, but are unsure about which of these modeling candidates or conceptual models are better, and, and that's very important, you have theoretical and practical identifiability of the candidate's models in the observed situation, then you can choose between them by comparing to observed uh, system behavior, but only then. Now, what are structure-based arguments? Structure-based arguments is any argument that's based on saying that the structure and the processes in the model are very similar to those structures and uh, processes that you have in reality. And what you associate, associate with that are kind of structural validation, process-based modeling, mechanistic models, micro-validation, as long as it's not behavior-based and so on. And um, the preconditions for these arguments to work are first that you have some complete and sufficiently accurate knowledge about the system structure and processes so that you can judge it's similar. Uh, 
And because everything is an abstraction in the model, it cannot be fully complete. So it has to be matching what is required by the research question. And you need to know what, what is needed for you. And the third kind of arguments are the robustness arguments. That's basically any argument that claims that, yes, the model is an abstraction. It's uncertain. It's inaccurate. But that uncertainty and inaccuracy doesn't affect my conclusion. So my conclusions are robust to this. So we have the associated terms are uncertainty analysis, robust decision making, model ensembles, confidence intervals, and so on. What you need for that is, of course, first knowing what certainty is enough or what uncertainty is tolerable for your research question. And secondly, you need to comprehensively really assess this uncertainty and trace it throughout the modeling process. So that you can at the end really say, this is my uncertainty and this is my bias. Otherwise, you cannot compare it. And well, the problem is, if you take all of this seriously, then uh, validation is not anymore a thing that you can do after building the model and just make a, a check. It's valid and uh, we do it. But it's something you have to keep doing from the start of, and throughout the whole modeling process from the beginning to the end. You need to understand what modeling context you're in. And you need to keep your arguments coherent and valid throughout the uh, modeling process. And this is why we came up with a protocol for building a structured argument that the conclusions have been validly drawn from the simulation analysis and to help authors and modelers and reviewers to communicate precisely. And um, just to highlight, I, I will only have time to give an overview of that not go really into the details, but it's probably best explained by saying, okay, we took the robustness arguments, the ones about tracking uncertainty and comparing it at the end as the outer framework for this protocol, because we need to track the uncertainty throughout the modeling process uh, to compare it at the end. And um, well, if you have a research question, if we think about the uncertainty in the modeling process at the start, you have a research question, you have complete uncertainty about this research question, otherwise you would be doing the analysis. And then you start thinking about some conceptual model. You do use your structural system knowledge, except in some data-driven cases, which I come to next, uh, to make a conceptual model. You make some structure-based model choice. And typically, you don't have only, you have a rough conceptual model, but there are many parameters in it, or there are maybe many um, uh, even different concepts theories that might work and you're not sure which to take. And this we would term the prior model uncertainty. And plus possibly some unmodeled uncertainty that you're not able to cast into a model. And then maybe you can use some kind of model selection based on observed behavior, some calibration or whatever you want to term it, some inverse modeling where you use observed system behavior to make some inference on which of these model candidates is maybe better than the other. And you get to posterior model uncertainty. And um, yeah, and then it depends a bit on your purpose. So if you have some kind of structure focused purpose, that means you do some hypothesis testing, you do some explanation, you want to do some theory de development. That means you're focusing on learning about the structure of the system. Then you're basically already there. Now you have to interpret this model uncertainty and draw some conclusion. If you have an output focused purpose, that means you want to do prediction, forecast, scenario analysis, or something like that, then you still have to translate that posterior model uncertainty in some predictive, I put quotation marks, which you can't see because my camera is off uh, around it, but some predictive um, simulation with hopefully uncertainty analysis to get some posterior predictive uncertainty. And that's the one then you interpret in this case uh, to look at the conclusion. And even though I'm using prior and posterior like in Bayesian analysis, it doesn't mean necessarily probability. It means any way of expressing uh, uncertainty here. Yeah, that's the outer framework. And now we have to make sure that the uncertainty is consistently tracked, consistently tracked and that what you're doing is actually uh, coherent and the structural arguments that you make, the behavior-based arguments that, we make, that you make actually fit what's fulfilled in the modeling context. And um, we have, uh, that means at every point you need to check, 
am I coherent? For example, at the structural based model choice, we basically have two cases. Um, the first case is you're wanting to do prediction. You have lots of data in a fully observed situation, no structural breaks, nothing. Uh, so fully repeatable, repeatable uh, sample. You're fine with the black box model. I call this the machine learning case. In that case, you can do a purely data-driven model uh, choice. You don't have to think about structure and so on. You let the ML do that for you. But in our cases that we work with, this is hardly ever the case. So we are rather in case two. And in this case, yeah, you have to think about what's the structurally adequate model. We have a checklist for that in the article. I'm not going into detail here because that would, uh, it's not enough for time. But there's a, uh, several criteria that we found. And um, yeah, then you end up with a set, possibly one, but probably more candidate model structures and typically also parameter ranges of which you're not so sure. And that's basically your prior model. And well, the, val the validity question here is make sure going through this checklist that the, the structured model that you're using is actually fitting those requirements that you have on the model. And then you go for behavior-based inference, if possible. And if you're in the purely data-driven case, then in the machine learning case, as I termed it, then you just do it. You just choose a loss function that's consistent with your research question. You use some cross-validation or so to deal with sampling error. And then you're basically, uh, your argument is purely based on behavior. And you have checked representativity, matched the research question control for or something around you're done. But in the other more frequent case, in all the other cases, you have your set of candidate model structure and your structures and parameter ranges. And you ask yourself, okay, can I now choose among them doing some calibration or model selection by comparing to data? And before you can do that, you have to first check whether the models are actually theoretically identifiable. That means not equifinal. They do produce different results actually for different for the same situation. And if yes, then you apply a proper model selection and estimation method, and you need to choose an appropriate loss function, do some cross validation and so on. Again, details in the paper, no time for this here, but there's a long list of things what you can do in different contexts uh, in the paper. And it's again, a question of yeah, choosing the right thing for the right uh, case. And then you finally check, well, do I, did I have enough data? So what's the, were the models practically identifiable or not? And if yes, then you have reduced the uncertainty and go on with the reduced posterior model uncertainty. If not, then you just have to say, no, uh, I can't reduce the uncertainty. I can't do calibration. I can't do model selection. I have to work with the uncertainty that I had before. So this different set of uh, model structures. And well, I, as I said, if you're doing some hypothesis testing or explanation or so, you're done at that point, you have to interpret. If we're doing some output focus analysis, some prediction scenario analysis or so, then we still have to do some forward simulations, you might call them predictive simulation. And that means you have to take the posterior model uncertainty that you have, and you have to, in addition, take the uncertainty about the target situation that you have, that means and certainly about the scenarios that you want to run, maybe climate change in the future, future prices or so. And build an appropriate simulation design, some sampling based uncertainty analysis or some strategies and explorative designs from robust decision making. Or there's also different cases that we discussed in the paper with what fits. And you run your simulation, your set of simulations, and you do the posterior, you, you get some distributions of, a, of model results, uh, some output. And then you finally interpret this final uncertainty. And depending on where you are, you have to take this into account and compare it to your research question. So what conclusion can we adequately draw from the simulation analysis, having the uncertainty that we have? And um, we have to know what is required for the research question. We use some abstract terms to describe this, to classify this like absolute or relative precision, conditional or unconditional prediction and so on. But it's probably best illustrated by some examples. So not an ABM question, but <laughs> a weather forecast question as a, a simple 
example, will it be warm enough on my vacation so I can leave my jacket at home? What is required? We need an unconditional prediction because we want to know how it's going to be. We're not comparing things. We want to know what weather we're going to have. And we need, need absolute precision because we want, if the temperature is unsure about more than two degrees or so, then we will not know whether to take the jacket or not. Right? Um, but it, in our cases, we are mostly rather in a case like this, where we have uh, we are comparing policies, for example, which policy X or Y is better, has a higher expected effect on poverty reduction under climate change. And we don't need to, an absolute prediction. We don't need to exactly predict how much is poverty reduced, but we need a conditional prediction and a rel with relative precision. So first conditional, because we can make it condition on some scenarios. Uh, which we don't know yet, and second, because it's enough if it, if it's relatively accurate. So it, it, it no, it, it this uncertainty doesn't change which policy is better or or uh, worse. Uh, we will never be able to predict exactly what will come out in the future. So if we have that, then we can conclude policy X better than Y and listen. And if not, then we have unclear conclusions or we have to say under which conditions uh, what or we have to do further. And if we have hypothesis testing, then we typically have some kind of significance or cross-validation criterion or some, and of course, assuming theoretical identifiability where we say, well, this is enough for us to say theory A is better than B. And this is, this is a much more difficult case, uh, I would say, because there it's, it's much less clear of what you're acceptable uncertainty. Yes, yeah, so summing up, um, I have gave I gave you an overview of uh, the Keep It Adequate protocol. I left out many of the details uh, of what to do in very specific situations. And I understand that the article, if you read it, is quite dense, so quite a lot of information. Um, but you, I hope you get that the intention was to have really a generic overview that comprehensively covers all the cases that you might face in ABM and beyond. Um, and to lay out the foundations, to lay out the basic argumentative structures against which you can then test or, or evaluate better uh, specific implementations and provide an overview of existing methods or link that link them to the context in which they are adequate and useful. And I think, of course, this is not enough. I think what we need to really get this working in practice and have people adopt this is um, to have some illustrative examples and case studies for different trajectories through the protocols, protocols where you can really see how it works or even derive some simplified protocols or match some protocols that already exist for specific classes of modeling efforts. For example, hypothesis testing in ecology is often pattern-oriented modeling. So match this to the protocol and say, yeah, that's one instantiation for this trajectory for, through the protocol. Uh, for this context, it will work. And um, yeah, what we also found is that it, it has a lot of things to consider. So uh, if you want to summarize this in, in, in an article, you probably need a short summary format for the documentation. And then last, but at least, but most importantly, we need over time gather experience in how it works. So far, it's a hypothesis itself, uh, the protocol, and we need to uh, apply it in practice over many cases to see whether it gives the right answers and it's usable by people uh, over time. Yeah, that's my talk for today. I think it was a bit more than 20 minutes, but I think we also started later. <laughs> that's great. Thanks, mm -hmm. Thanks Christian. That's, that's awesome. Um, yeah, we started a few minutes late, so um, that was about about right. So thanks, that's good. So um, we can open to questions now um, from the audience. If there are any at this point, any points of discussion or clarification, um, Callum, hi Callum. First. Hi, hi James. Hi Christian. Thanks very much for your talk and the really nice paper as well. Um, I don't know how useful a question it is really, but something that always bothers me in this area is how do we make these things applicable in the sense that, you know, it's always easier not to bother and you can publish without bothering, especially if you're not doing agent-based modeling. So that if we do it, there's a penalty as well as a, a benefit, right? And I, 
I'm not sure that any of us have ever reached the point where we have a a way of evaluating models that's you know accessible, feasible within existing systems and also robust. I don't know if you have thoughts having gone through this process and tried to get it adopted. Where do you think the balance lies? What's the way forward? Well, should I answer? Yeah, uh, Robert, or do you want to answer? Yes, um, thanks, Christian, also from my side. And maybe I, 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 I give a first thought about this. Um, so there are three aspects that, that, that I see coming out of this protocol. Uh, which are not immediately uh, somehow a benefit for all of us individually, but over time it might help to to somehow also uh, increase the level of modeling across all of us so that there's some kind of community effort behind that protocol, I think. And and the third thing that is is that I use actually the the protocol also for teaching. So that I use this section two where Christian is um, um, uh, deriving these these premises and the, the different concepts also with my PhD students and, and try to sensibilize them also for their application of the model and also with our master students to really have a discussion. And I think that's already something that the protocol can, can bring into uh, the discussion, how we address these issues from the bottom up. This, the second point is certainly that um, when reviewing, um, I usually do not, if I review agent-based models, I don't say, well, you have to go through the protocol and give me a documentation of everything because I think that that would simply be too much. But still, I think in every case, I usually have one point where, where I think it would be really helpful to have more information and then this is, the, the protocol can be like a very good uh, reference for that. And in that case, I also think that over time, since at least in the agricultural economics uh, field where I'm working in, the, the number of agent-based models is not hundreds, right? There's there's a, a given set of models. So that also there by um, hinting to these problems and, and make them explicit in the description of the papers, this could also help to, to base some more, um, let's say, uh, information about how these models work. And the last point, of course, in my own model work, I'm also guilty of not having thought about the protocol when we first designed our model. And, and that's really nothing that I can change afterwards. But having the, 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 the protocol now, it really helps us to, to think about the, the individual steps, how we further develop, or if we apply it, how, we, how we're going to build that. And, and I think it's more an incremental step forward. So to say that with the protocol, you have certain arguments that you can can somehow address with uh, developing or extending your model. And from there on that it, it somehow it, it builds up and not only for myself, but later on, maybe as uh, Christian mentioned uh, in the last slide, over time that also this provides uh, the opportunity to not only be replicable, but really also to, to have a full documentation and maybe also that others can use your model and apply it to, to do all the things we, we can do, but we don't have the resources to do them. So that would be my point, but maybe Christian, you wanna add something on that? Yeah, I mean, I agree fully. I mean, the, the review point is also basically what, uh, what was a part of my motivation, the review and the author's point of view, like uh, in the review to say, well, look at this. I don't have to explain all the arguments why this is important and so on. I can tell you, uh, look at the protocol. This is basically gives the argument and I see a problem there at that point. So I don't have to write a, a page, but, uh, and this, uh, the same for an author, I can say, well, I'm in this context. I can use the protocol to argue why I'm not placing emphasis on, on goodness of fit in this particular case, but because why I'm placing emphasis on, on having a good uncertainty analysis in the end, because in my case, using the words of the protocol, I can justify that it wouldn't even be uh, relevant to look at goodness of fit maybe in that, in that case, because the, 
the feelings that I had often in discussion is that people are not discussing about the same thing. Are, one is one says good is a fit and the other one no but and then people start about what good is a fit but that wasn't the question the question was identifiability or something like that right so uh, the first idea is to provide words and uh, and steps where you can first agree okay what are we talking about are we talking about now about the choice of the goodness of fit method that is wrong or are we talking about that you shouldn't use one at all because it's not identifiable at all or, 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 or something like that that was one thing and um, <clears throat> I think if you look at the whole protocol and really assume that you have to do everything every time, uh, then, it, then it's overwhelming. I, not only in terms of documentation, but also in terms of uh, doing it. But I mean, there are subtle things in, that we wrote in the article where we say, um, for example, of course, you can't test all the possible candidate model formulations. You don't have the time for that. But you should at least acknowledge that you tested only some. And then don't state this is the best model uh, because um, you haven't tested all of them. You, it's maybe the best one among the ones that we've tested, but not the best model overall, right? And I, I happen to find this in, uh, in, in reviews all the time that people do that, right? And then I... Uh, that's the point of the unmodeled uncertainty, right? That you, in your interpretation, there's always the possibility to move things to unmodeled uncertainty, but in the end, you shouldn't forget about it, right? right? You should, in your interpretation, at least in the discussion, make, make sure. And uh, going forward, yeah, I guess these things probably have to, I already list, made a list of way forward, right? And the other things I could imagine is you make uh, an article where you say, these are the common pitfalls that you shouldn't trap into, and you can use the uh, the protocol to to say why this is a uh, is a pitfall uh, without every time arguing the whole thing, right? I mean, so uh, that might help. For example, uh, what would be a common pitfall in 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 in, 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 in on, on validation? Right. And then, of I course, see. good examples. Uh, uh, good examples uh, saying in this context, the, this has worked or so. That's like a library, take the modeling context for the article and say, this is an example for that context and it worked there. But it doesn't necessarily work in a different context. That's great. Thanks, Christian. Thanks, Robert, for your, your <laughs> thoughts on, on that. Um, yeah, it sounds like you're, you, you, as you say, there's a lot in the paper. There's a lot you've just kind of, you know, maybe not skimmed the surface. You've got a little bit below the surface, but there's a lot of detail in there that I think people would find really useful to go and look at in, in the paper if they if they haven't already. And as you highlight, you know, there's different ways in which this could be be taken. So um this is almost just like this, I guess, the starting point for this protocol. Um it's not it's not finished, right? It's it's something still it's a it's a living living thing. It's yeah, that's what we what we wrote at the end of the conclusion, right? This is for now a hypothesis, a, a, a foundation to start from. And we hope that many people take it into consideration and it grows uh, into something that's, yeah. If you really want to do it, you probably need a textbook, not an article. <laughs> <laughs> Robert, you have a quick point to make before we move on? Yes, a very quick one. So I think um, what I also think very interesting is this, reusable building blocks that have come that have also been published in in the same journal and i just think that starting from there would also be something where these incremental steps can be also be used to to think about the validation process uh, in a broader sense yeah great that, that that's a nice point Noah. I need to remember there are other um, tools out there that we can combine uh, these sorts of things with, yeah, for sure. Well, thanks both. Um, I mean, um, uh, there's lots more to, to get stuck into that, but we should move on to our uh, second presenter. Um, so now we'll hand over uh, to Tim, Tim Williams, um, who's currently with Climate Farmers. Um, but Tim, I'll let you introduce yourself properly um, and hand over to you. Yeah, that sounds good. Thank you. Can you see my screen and hear me? Yes, all good. Perfect. Cool. Yeah, well, I'm a little, uh, little nervous, actually, after Christian's presentation, because I had not uh, planned to talk about uh, the robustness uh, arguments and things like that. But I think that 
in this work, we actually, it was quite interesting to hear your talk, Christian. I think we we made some behavior-based arguments and some robustness-based arguments in our model, but maybe didn't have the vocabulary for that. And so I'm definitely going to check out your paper in some more detail. And yeah, uh, be, be one of the first examples maybe of, of applying this. Um, but yeah, so my name is Tim, and I am currently working at a small startup called Climate Farmers in Germany, but I was previously a postdoc at Freie University in Amsterdam, and I'm going to talk about work today that I did during my postdoc time uh, with these wonderful collaborators that you see here on the slide. And I'm going to try and make three points uh, in this talk today. Uh, the first is that to transition to sustainability, uh, it is important to consider power dynamics. Uh, second is that modeling is a potentially useful and perhaps necessary tool to do this. And uh, I'm going to give an overview of a model that we developed that makes a first stab at, at modeling some of these uh, power dynamics in agricultural and food system. So why is this important? I think I don't need to convince anyone uh, in this audience really, but agricultural systems as they stand today produce a lot of food, but kind of at the expense of, of many other outcomes that we care about. Uh, and this is a problem not just in agriculture itself, but also within the entire food system. The food that is cheap and available to people is often not the most healthy, uh, and this contributes to many problems of obesity, overnutrition, undernutrition, and disease, and so on. And my cat is gonna keep interrupting, I think. So we have these systems, uh, these industrial agri-food systems that are not so good, unfortunately, for people and the planet. Uh, and also, unfortunately, they're kind of locked in. There are many vested interests, concentrated power, uh, past dependencies and attitudes and cultures that are really quite difficult to change. And so ideally, what we would like to see is some more sustainable alternative. Uh, in order to realize this, we need to somehow overcome this resistance to change uh, and transition from where we are now to something hopefully better. And so what might give rise to this kind of emergent outcome of a, of a transition to sustainability? Ultimately, it emerges from the decisions of many disaggregated actors. Uh, and this is what a lot of us work on here is trying to model these actors and these decisions. Uh, farmers are going to need to change how they manage their land. Uh, but critically, this is not just a problem of farming. Uh, it's a problem throughout the entire food system. Uh, there are many different actors, uh, networks, and ecosystems of actors within the food system, uh, and they all interact in complex ways. Uh, and these interactions are, are pretty important, actually, for setting the kind of boundary conditions uh, on which each of these actors is making decisions. And this network or these, these kind of power relations within this network are, in a way, a bit of a double-edged sword. Uh, so if we're stuck in a lock-in, there are some actors who are really trying to prohibit change from happening uh, and make it difficult for anyone to change their behavior. But on the flip side, if we have kind of a transition ongoing or, or changes happening, actors in these relationships within these networks can sort of also have an enabling uh, dynamic and allow people to share information and share ideas to make uh, change processes easier. So yeah, in a way we can consider these power dynamics as important uh, and also both constraining and enabling change at a system level. So this is the first key point here is to transition to sustainability. Uh, I'm arguing that it's important to consider power dynamics and to transition from what I would call the status quo at the moment where capital is held by uh, globalized value chains, chemical companies, and pharma lobbies. And I'm kind of caricaturing it a little bit here, but uh, to keep it simple, food is kind of seen as a commodity, and the status quo is uh, reinforced by these processes. And ideally, we'd want to just transition to some alternative where capital is perhaps more equally distributed among food system actors, and we don't value food just as a commodity, but also for its social and environmental qualities as well. 
And ideally, this alternative also is, is reinforced in some way. And this brings me to the second point of modeling as a potentially useful tool. I, again, don't think I need to uh, convince this audience here, but essentially in agricultural food systems, we have many different interacting processes, social, political, economic, environmental, and models are kind of useful tools for helping to characterize uh, and experiment with these interacting processes. We also have a global food system, but there's also a lot of regional diversity and heterogeneity within that. And models are similarly useful tools for characterizing and experimenting with this heterogeneity. And finally, uh, I think this is quite important, but while we may have some kind of local examples of, of new food initiatives, uh, there is limited empirical evidence of full system uh, transitions towards some alternative uh, and models are useful tools also for kind of building on what we know currently from empirical knowledge and extending that forward. So I'm going to spend the, the remainder of the time talking about the first attempt that we made to model some of these power dynamics in agricultural and food systems. Uh, and how these power dy dynamics might change in some very stylistic agri-food transition. So the model is an agent-based model, and each agent is characterized by two different state variables. The first of these state variables is capital, which describes, as it says here, the bundles of material and immaterial assets that actors draw from in their social practices and interactions. So You've probably seen these terms before of economic capital, techni te technological capital, natural capital, social capital. And so we kind of lump all of those things together into one uh, variable called capital. Uh, the second is values. And this describes the relative priorities attached to different objectives in agri-food systems. And we conceptualize for simplicity at this stage, values varying over a single uh, continuous axis ranging on one hand from food being perceived as a commodity, as I described before, to on the other side, food embedding social ecological qualities, uh, which we call an alternative. And in reality, there are many different kinds of alternatives, but just for simplicity here, we just use this one dimensional scale. And how does this relate to this word power that I'm using? Uh, the way that we are perceiving this or framing this in this work is that uh, the interactions between capital and values are kind of a useful lens for understanding power uh, and that ex actors exercise power to build their capital and spread their values within the agri-food system. And so this is the kind of variables that we're modeling. Uh, the outcome that we're interested in looking for is what I've been calling a transition. And essentially that's a shift in the balance of power between these two different paradigms where we begin with a kind of dominant conventional system. And then over time that fades away and is replaced by some alternative. And so that was the outcome. Now what I'm gonna describe is sort of the mechanisms that we're modeling in a conceptual way. Uh, and this is inspired by some, a paper by Clapp and Fuchs 2009, which I found is a really useful way of conceptualizing the different ways in which actors can exercise power. The first of these is to directly influence another's practices. This is called instrumental power. Uh, and some of you may be familiar with this MOHUB framework diagram. Uh, but what we're perceiving here is essentially examples of like coercion, uh, where maybe someone has made some decision they've selected from their perceived behavioral options, uh, but then someone else comes along and exerts some influence that means that the behavior perhaps doesn't align fully with that, that selected choice. The second is that actors can use their capital to influence others' values, which is called discursive power. And that's playing out on this kind of part of the, this diagram here. So affecting the, the goals and needs or values of, of uh, the individual, as well as perhaps the, the mechanisms through which they evaluate the different options. And then the final mechanism is uh, structural power which is influencing the option space of other actors. And so this is by affecting uh, like the payoffs and rewards to uh, different decision options or perhaps uh, affecting the perceived behavioral options themselves. 
So we have uh, capital and values as the two variables that we're modeling as a lens to understand power. Uh, we have this outcome of a transition, shifting the balance of power from this conventional to the alternative. And we are modeling actors who can exercise power in different ways. So using these concepts, we developed an agent-based model, and this model represents the interactions between several kinds of actors in agri-food systems. We model flows of capital between the state and farmers through subsidies, as well as throughout a simplified value chain, which has two distinct actors, a conventional market actor with conventionally leaning values and an alternative market actor with alternatively leaning values. And on top of these capital flows, we also model the various ways in which these actors can impact each other's values. Uh, so for example, with various actors lobbying the state agent to change its subsidy structure, as well as these market actors uh, influencing the values of both farmers and consumers. And it's, it's not shown here fully, but we model somewhat distinct communities within these farmer and consumer populations. Uh, we model discursive influence within the kind of social networks of, of these agent groups as well. And the key model outcome that we're interested in, like I said before, is this transition. And we measure that as what fraction of trade uh, at each time step flows through this alternative market actor. And I'm gonna take a step back here actually for a, a quick second and say, where does this all come from? Uh, we are not making any claims that this represents any particular reality, uh, but the actors and uh, processes that are modeled are based on a review that I conducted a couple of years ago of uh, the actors and uh, network, kind of agri-food network interactions within European uh, food systems. And so while we don't represent a particular place, uh, these actors and interactions are, are probably most relevant to a context like Europe. But so we have these different actor groups, uh, we have these different interactions between capital and values, uh, and we have this key model outcome of at each time step, what fraction of the trade flows through each of these different markets. Um, and I'm not going to unfortunately have time to go through all of the details of the model processes, but essentially one of the main things modeled at each time step is the decisions of these individual farmer and consumer agents who decide at each time point, they make a binary decision, should I trade with the conventional or the alternative market? And we model these decisions as being influenced by four different factors. The first of these is capital returns. So which of these two markets uh, it's going to yeah, give you the best bang, bang for your buck in a way. Uh, the second is the value alignment. So which of these two markets aligns most closely with uh, my values, which are changing over time throughout the simulation, as you'll see soon. The third is what did I do previously, some like resistance to change. And finally, uh, the market agent's capital. And so this is a factor that represents the ways in which these market agents uh, can impact decisions beyond the mechanisms of price uh, and values. So you can think, for example, like uh, a supermarket uh, versus a farmer's market. So the supermarket is it's everywhere. It's open all the time. Uh, and so it's very easy to buy your food there compared to like a farmer's market that's maybe only open on, on Saturday or something like that. And so within these four elements uh, and all of the other model processes, which I'm not going to uh, go in detail unless you have questions about it later, uh, we represent these, these three key power mechanisms that I introduced before. So structural power by allowing agents to use their capital to influence prices to their advantage. Discursive power uh, by modeling these kind of blue lines here as being stronger uh, with higher agent capital. So if you have a capital rich agent, you can actually affect others' values more readily. Uh, and finally, instrumental power through this fourth uh, mechanism that I described just now. So in order to explore this model, we began by initializing it with a degree of lock-in to the conventional paradigm. So a strong conventional market actor and farmer and consumer values that primarily align with the conventional paradigm. And then we designed a set of four interventions uh, that progressively intervene at, at, at deeper leverage points in the system. First, by increasing the capital 
available to the state and consumer actors. Uh, second, by reducing the strength of some of the model feedbacks. Third, by decreasing the extent to which actors are able to accumulate and exercise power. And finally, by simulating an external influence, an external force that pushes 50% of the farmer and consumer agents' values towards the alternative paradigm. And so under baseline conditions, without any of these interventions active, we see that uh, the system, which is initialized with a strong conventional market actor, kind of cements that status and stays that way. This, this actor gains capital over time, uh, and the farmers that trade with the conventional market have higher capital than those trading with the alternative market. And despite a kind of distribution of, of values across the spectrum to begin with, these sort of tend towards, for most agents, towards this conventional paradigm by the end of the simulation. And consequently, we have a reducing share of, of this alternative market. And so when we implement the most extreme intervention, which is this, in this case, pushing 50% uh, of the farmer and consumer values over time towards this alternative paradigm. So you can see that in uh, part D here, uh, these agents, there's an external force outside of the model that pushes these actors' values towards this paradigm. We see that we start with still this dominant conventional market, but that over time there is a transition uh, in which the alternative takes over as the dominant market and actually the farmers trading with that market uh, have higher capital on average than those trading with uh, the conventional market. Sorry, this is a lot. Uh, <laughs> I've almost there. Um, and so when exploring these, these four different interventions in more detail next to each other, we find that uh, with each of these top three interventions by themselves, uh, they actually can perhaps counterintuitively increase the dominance of the conventional paradigm and that we really need this like shift in values in order to achieve any kind of transition or any kind of uptake in this alternative market. But we find that when these implement, uh, interventions are implemented together, uh, the barriers to transition are reduced. Uh, and so the rationale for doing this is that uh, changing 50% of, of farmer and consumer values is like pretty extreme. Uh, and so ideally, maybe we'd be able to bundle together some different kinds of, of actions such that fewer uh, agents' values or fewer uh, actors' values need to change. And so we find that, for example, when we also implement this moderate power concentration intervention, uh, we can get away with actually only 20% or so of uh, agents' values changing in order to achieve a dominant alternative market. So kind of by acting at multiple of these different leverage points simultaneously, uh, the model looks like it uh, exhibits some kind of social tipping points in a way uh, in which the system can change rather rapidly under a small change in the external conditions. So like any modeling study, uh, there are limitations. Uh, we obviously don't model everything. Uh, we don't model environmental processes or outcomes. We don't model technology or yields. Uh, and like I said before, we don't claim that this represents any particular reality. But with that being said, I think that we make a, a valiant effort in a way to attempt to represent some of these, these processes that have been shown to be important empirically. Uh, and that by doing so, we're able to explore how these transitions may arise or not arise under a range of experimental conditions. And so, yeah, I'm interested in what everyone else thinks. Uh, what did you find interesting about this? Is there some stuff you disagree with or uh, find hard to understand? Uh, and yeah, do you see any opportunities also for integrating these kind of dynamics into your own work? Uh, so yeah, this was funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation through the CPATH project. And yeah, thank you for your time. And I'm happy to answer any questions in the couple of minutes that we have remaining. Brilliant. Thanks, Tim. That's awesome. And no worries. Uh, we started your section a little bit late, so uh, we've, we have we can uh, extend for a few minutes, um, a little bit longer with questions and discussion if we need to. So yes, we're approaching the hour. If you need to, if people in the audience need to leave to go to other meetings, no problem. Um, but we'll continue for a little bit longer. Um, and the, the recording from this should be online or available by email uh, shortly. Um, so I can see all 
has their hand up. Let's go first. I'll... Yeah, thanks so much, Tim. That was really interesting. Um, so uh, one of the things that, you know, like more conventional model structures struggle with is uptake of these environmental, agro-environmental schemes, right? Because, um, well, certainly in my experience in working in policy, a more sort of like narrow economic view ends up overestimating uptake rate because it doesn't have this kind of stickiness between a sort of conventional and um, unconventional system or production system. So my question, I suppose, is like, you know, you said at the very end that, that, that you know, empirically, these power relationships um, influence rates of change. So I wonder, like, how far you can use your model to demonstrate that uh, that including these relationships results in more plausible uh, projected uptake rates than a kind of optimization based model might. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Thanks for the question. I think I can't give a super satisfying answer <laughs> at this stage. I mean, I think in terms of plausibility, I think this model is not really designed to do that. And I think that would be maybe a, a, another research project. Like you said, there's a lot of these agent-based models looking at agri-environmental scheme uptake. Uh, and it would be interesting to get one of those models that exists already and add some additional feedback of, of maybe values or something like that. Maybe if you have changing values over time influenced by social uh, feedbacks, maybe that allows a more realistic yeah, representation of, of what we see empirically. But yeah, th this model is, is by no means at a stage where it, it can be used to assess plausibility. Um, so yeah, I think the idea was that we were, this, this model was to start quite abstractly and to look at the dynamics, but I think an, an alternative way of, of, of modeling these power dynamics is to take a very empirical model uh, with more empirical details and then begin to add some of these feedbacks. And yeah, I mean, it would be interesting to see what that would do uh, because, yeah, I mean, economic decision-making is dominating most European farmers at the moment, right? But, or maybe Callum would disagree with that. Uh, but particularly in these alternative paradigms, econ economics becomes less important. Uh, and I think this values dimension is quite important. And also with this, this capital variable, it, it was really hard when writing this paper to like not just connote capital with money, uh, but the idea is that this capital is, is representing more than, than just economics. Um, any other questions? Feel free to type questions in the chat if you don't want to raise your hand. Um, Tim, I was just wondering um, about the kind of, I don't know if this is the right word, performativity of the model, um, how the model itself can be play a role in the system. Um, so by maybe by showing how if people if values of individuals or institutions change, that um, that can be a really important component of of, of shifting uh, behavior. You know, could the model itself be a, useful to change people's values, for example? I mean, mm. um, and if so, uh, uh, or what might it need? What um, level of realism might it need to 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 start doing that sort of thing? Yeah, and I, it's always makes me uncomfortable when I like put a something on a map or something like a model on a map, and I, I, I yeah. really, I'm, I'm kind of happy with how stylized it is at the mo at the moment because I'm not, no one's going to take these these outcomes as predictions, right? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, I mean, yeah, I think with all these things, good visualizations are important, right? But if we could demonstrate some different scenarios, and yeah, again, I don't have a good answer. Well, I guess also, another, if I mm -hmm. yeah, another way of asking my question might be, of the of the different actors that you represented in the model, who might this model be most relevant to? Is it just for scientists? Is it just for us to think about, or is or could it be, or is there a point in that system where you think this would really be useful? 
Yeah, I think an interesting thing that I didn't talk so much about is that like the role of subsidies. And I think in Europe, that's like really important. And obviously, the state plays like a super strong role in, in agriculture throughout Europe. And there's a lot of conversation about re redirecting subsidies towards more kind of environmental eco schemes. And that that is happening. And I, I think it would be I don't know, an interesting thought experiment to, to do some some local example in which kind of regional subsidy structures did change uh, and try, try and represent that in the model and see was that initiated through social processes and how did how did those kind of those changes in values actually propagate throughout the system. Uh, and so yeah, I think using as a tool for like long term policy planning, perhaps, but uh, again, this is still quite an academic exercise at the moment. And I think it would be also, the idea was that it would be of interest to people in this kind of community uh, mm -hmm. who are perhaps modeling, but not including some of these more power or, or discursive components uh, to think about how they could be integrated into existing models. Yeah, for sure. I think um, it's it's definitely useful from, from that perspective to, to get people thinking about dimensions, influences, processes that that aren't being represented in other, in other ways, in other places, other models. Yeah, great. Right. Any other questions from the audience at this point? Um, if not, well, we can we can start to to wrap up. Um, so that was two super interesting presentations. Um, so. Really grateful again, thanks to the speakers for taking the time to, to present that. Um, hopefully we'll we'll plan um, some more uh, webinars um, in due course. I'm just gonna share my screen um, quickly um, to highlight the kind of next activity that we've got um, kind of for the working group. Um, we will be at the open science, the GLP open science meeting in Oaxaca in Mexico in November. Um, so any of you who are joining that conference, um, we will be there and we have a session, uh, behavioral land system models for imagining and evaluating alternative futures. That's session 205R. We don't have the timetable or the schedule uh, yet, but um, we've had a bunch of really interesting abstracts that have been submitted. Um, and so we're going to have a, a nice session uh, with some full oral presentations um, and also probably some flash talks as well. So any of you, um, if any of you are going to the Open Science Meeting, please, please do zap me an email and um, yeah, we'll definitely have to meet up in person. Um, there I know it's a long way to go from, from Europe or from other, other places, but um, uh, so that's our next kind of um, activity. Um, We'll, we'll think about organizing more online activities um, uh, and elsewhere um, uh, later. So um, we'll pause it there. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, I hope to get see you again soon. <laughs>